Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Welcome our audience here to CSD webinar. DHH best practices in STEM education. This is a fourth in a series and tonight's title is deaf and hard of hearing women in the STEM field. So let's welcome our panelists tonight here on the video screen with me. Let's get some hands waving in the air. Before we begin the webinar, we do want to make sure that your Zoom application is set and updated. If you're experiencing any difficulties, make sure you're using the most updated version of Zoom. Also, if you can adjust your settings to gallery view, that will allow you to have the PowerPoint slides open to the side of the video screens of the presenters. And you can also adjust the slides to change the size between both. If you have any technical issues, please enter them into the chat box. Also, tonight's webinar does have captioning subtitles. In order to have them be viewable, you must click on the CC box, closed caption box that is down towards the bottom of the screen. Once you click that, it'll open up a menu, which will offer you to show subtitles. And again, if you experience any problems with these settings, reach out to our team here via the chat box. And so we'll get moving with the webinar. And as we do, if any questions come to your mind, please type those in to our Q&A questions. If you have any technical issues or any problems, enter those into our chat box. So we have two different uh, boxes going, one for question and answers and another for chat. As we move along and we do get questions in the Q&A box, I will go ahead and sign those panels for our viewers, sign those questions for our viewers, and then move forward with responding. This is Scott. I just want to remind everyone, if you need technical support questions answered, we have those in the chat box. We have captions. We have sign language interpreters voiceover. Everything we need in place to make this webinar accessible to our audience. Today's topic, Deaf and Hard of Hearing Women in STEM, is a topic we selected because typically the STEM field, the sciences field, are heavily populated by men. However, more and more women are becoming involved in the STEM field, and there are still challenges to be faced because it is such a densely populated field by men. So we want to keep in mind the goal of working towards having a diverse workforce, which through diverse perspectives that are brought by women, allow us to tackle STEM issues that are affecting our lives. Also, having deaf and hard of hearing women in STEM, we can offer role models for young female deaf and hard of hearing students to see their representation in the STEM field. On the slide there, you can see the name of our panelist. I'll introduce myself. This is Scott, Scott Cohen speaking. And this is my sign here, letter B on the ear. I'm a doctoral student at Georgia State University. And I'm here to host the STEM webinar. 
which have been produced so that deaf students have role models to look up to. And at this point, I'll begin with our panelist. And go ahead and introduce yourself, please. Hello, I'm Joanna Lucht. This is my sign name. And I currently work at NASA in California. My job is as an electronics engineer, and I'm primarily responsible really for many very different things. I wear many different hats, but I develop software, which means I write code and programs that are then put into aircraft. Also, I have a team of researchers that have specific data they need. They measure temperature, wind, sound. They need all of that data for their research, and they come to me with their needs and requests, and I develop a program that can be put into the aircraft to measure all of these atmospheric, um, all of this atmospheric data. And then all of that is gathered and given back to these researchers for their studies. So really that's my role in a nutshell. And this is Scott. Thank you, Johanna. Where do you work? I'm in Southern California. The town is called Edwards Air Force Base. Or the area is Edwards Air Force Base and I work for NASA, as you can see here. Thank you so much, Johanna. Now we'll move on to Ashley. Please introduce yourself, Ashley. Hello, everyone. My name is Ashley Dillard. This is my sign name. I work as a medical lab technician, an MLT, for Grand Clinic. So I work in the lab department and uh, we take various different specimens that are turned into the lab, work with various chemicals. We do specific things such as urine analysis, immunology, slash coagulation, microbiology, um, and urology type work. And once a specimen comes into the lab, we figure out the diagnosis of the patient and we report back to the doctors within our clinic. They then see if there's a specific treatment to offer the patient or it's for their, their best uh, decision, they, the doctors that is. Ashley, thank you so much for that. Let me ask you also where you're located. Oh, yes. I'm here in Bowling Green, Kentucky. It's in the southern point of Kentucky, near the border of Kansas. Well, thank you so much, Ashley. Moving along, moving along to our next panelist, Melissa, go ahead. Hello, I'm Melissa Manick, and I go by Melly for short. This is my sign name. I am a UX and uh, integration designer. UX stands for user experience. So I'm a user experience designer, a user interface designer, and in short, I work for United Airlines. And I have a team that I work with that focuses on accessibility design to make sure that all the products that um, have to do with flights are accessible to deaf people, uh, blind people, at really any person. Um, we figure out accessibility uh, for these people. Thank you, Melissa. What area are you in? I'm in Chicago. Great. Now, I'd like to take the time to ask the audience if you can clearly see the four of us on the video screen plus the PowerPoint. And if you're experiencing problems, please go ahead and mention those in the chat box. In the PowerPoint, you should see a slide that says, who are we with the CSD team? And you can see it says CSD Learns team. That is a team that 
organized today's webinar and got us the audience here today that we have with us tonight. So thank you, CSD team, for that support. Now, to edit the screen, when you look at the PowerPoint and the video screens right between them, you should see a marker. You can take that marker and drag it to either side, and you can change the size of, again, either the PowerPoint or our video screens. And this is Scott. We'd also like to thank and recognize General Motors uh, for their contributions and helping make this webinar possible. Very well. We're ready to start at this point. Time to dive in now. All right. Okay. First question I'd like to ask you all is, how did you get hooked on STEM? When did the light bulb go off for you? What was your aha moment? And when did you realize, I can be a part of STEM? We'll start with Johanna. Well, let me explain my background first. I was born in Germany. My parents are American. Um, I am still an American citizen. Um, and I did not have any language when I was young, ASL or English, really until the age of nine. And school was really rough for me. It was very frustrating. I didn't understand anything that was discussed in school except for math. When it came to numbers and calculations, I got it. So math was the very first thing I understood. And then at the age of nine, I began to learn ASL and I picked it up quickly. But I've always had a very strong fascination with math and I always knew that that was something I could do and do well. Then the University of Washington had a summer program. It was a nine, nine week program, I believe, in computer science. And so that was my first exposure to computer science as part of that program. And then I became hooked from that point on in coding. I was able to figure out different problems. And so that touched on STEM with the science and the technology part of STEM. And then working with NASA, I used my major of computer science. But then at NASA, I shifted over really to engineering. So I do touch on every part of S, the S-T-E-M in STEM. And so, yeah, I've changed my passion. Uh, I'm now focused on engineering mostly. However, all those prior experiences are still a part of me. Um, really, it all comes down to problem solving and having challenges that I face and have to figure out. That really has driven my passion. Well, thank you so much for that, Johan. No. Moving on, I'd like to ask Ashley the same question. How did I get hooked into STEM? Well, when I was a junior and senior in high school, I had an interest in biology. And then I went to Gallaudet and declared my major to be biology because I was interested in plants and very, you know, the wide range of what's involved in biology. And I've always been curious. Honestly, growing up, science was not my favorite subject. Not until my late teens, I'd say, is when I developed an interest. Um, but I liked the hands-on experience, the experiments and problem solving that you have to do within the lab, coming up with different uh, ideas related to science. That's what really fascinated me. I'd say my aha moment was when I was a student at Gallaudet, I had to figure out, you know, what specifically I was interested in because biology covers a wide range of topics. And I was always interested in working in the lab. I was curious about working in the lab, playing with, you know, chemicals and specimen uh, analysis of diseases and genes. And then after graduating from Gallaudet, I didn't know what I wanted to do exactly, but then I found out about a 
about laboratory sciences. And I knew exactly that that was it for me. I wanted to be involved in that. Thank you, Miss Ashley. Thank you so much for that. And of course, we'll pass the floor now on to Melissa. Okay, well, I'd say my journey was not a typical one, was not focused on STEM. I really was fully immersed in art growing up. Not so much painting, but more I was interested in designing and the de designs and how they apply to the real world. I wanted to go into a de industrial design, but I was nervous about it. A lot of people said it wasn't a great career, so I decided to follow my parents, so to speak, and go into architecture. Uh, urban planning, to be exact. However, I really did not fall in love with it. And at that time, I was just out of college. I went to work for Apple in sales, and I really loved working there because I felt like there I could problem solve with customers if they say if they were struggling with a particular uh, product or computer, they weren't having a good experience with their iPhone or something, I could show them things that really helped them ha have a better experience, whether that be with their phone or app. And I really enjoyed that problem solving a lot. But that wasn't really an immediate aha. I'd say I had a slow growing aha moment. Really, it was when I entered my graduate studies. I was studying urban planning at uh, Gallaudet, Deaf Space with Hansel Bowman at Gallaudet. And I really loved studying deaf space. Uh, it wasn't more so much the physical space, it was more the technical space, making that an integrative experience. That's where I had the aha moment. And um, it was a lot of studies. It was four years that I had taken, uh, studied to graduate with my master's degree, but I went back in. Um, I didn't follow the normal track of a bachelor's and master's degree. I just diverged because I was so passionate about that. So really, it was a slow aha. It wasn't just that quick uh, knowing. It really took me a while. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah, thank you. So, Melissa, your employment really didn't come up till later in life is what you mean by that slow aha moment that you said, right? Uh, Apple phones, right? There was a time where there were no Apple phones. I mean, we were in high school. We didn't have Apple phones. Right. And Ashley, your experience, once you came into the lab and had your hands-on moment and started getting a sense of what it was like, then you really dove in, right? Yes, that's right. And Johanna, you had a touch upon the various aspects of STEM for each one, for each letter, and then it finally wove together for you. Yeah, problem solving and facing things creatively, really all parts of STEM use those types of skills and that's why it's such, I love it. That's really neat, really cool on everyone's behalf. Okay, moving on to our next question. Uh, who or what person may have inspired you or pushed you and allowed you to continue in STEM? We'll go ahead and start with Miss Ashley. <laughs> uh, well, that's a good question. The people who inspired me to become involved with STEM, and of course, most people from my Gallaudet days know who I'm talking about, but I'm going to go ahead and say their name. My most, most favorite professor, Ava Morrow. She's now retired. She's been retired for a few years, but this woman was an incredible inspiration to me. I took her class, uh, I think it was intro to biology uh, in my sophomore year. And it was amazing to see a woman who looked like me, who could also, uh, you know, I was just so in awe of her in her class. I would always ask her questions in her class and in lab. And then later on in uh, my years, I, my academic counselor, um, uh, I kept in touch with. But this 
woman was specifically a, a major inspiration to me uh, to get involved with STEM. Thank you for your response, Ashley. I really appreciate that. Thank you. I remember we actually took classes together. Yes, we were. Micro, yeah, microbiology with Dr. Marrow. Yes, really neat knowing that uh, she inspired you. Wow. Moving on, same question, Miss Melissa. Okay, well, uh, I don't have one particular person uh, that, like, uh, there's no one else that was like Hansel Bowman, who is in architecture and urban planning, even though it's not the exact same field. Um, he inspired me to do research. I did a lot of research, and my job requires a lot of research, which is interviewing people and understanding their experience using deaf space. That really, Hansel was the first inspiration that helped and uh, helped navigate me through this process. But really, um, most or more recently, a person who has inspired me a lot, who's working in this field, is Ruben Grammer. Who works, uh, really, I've just learned a lot from him. Um, there's not a lot of people doing what he's doing in the industry. He's one of the first people who went into the deaf accessibility industry, and so I learned a lot from him. Um, he worked. I worked for a deaf company, and I decided I wanted a more diverse company rather than a deaf-only company. So I decided to transition and work for a hearing company, and I learned a lot from him. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for that as well. Really neat. It's nice for you to highlight the role models in the field as well. And now we'll ask Johanna the same question. I can't say that there was just one person who inspired me. There were many. And uh, there may, really a lot of people may have just been encouraged, encouraging me behind the scenes, and I was unaware. But in middle school, I went to math camp, and my dad, who's an engineer, my dad encouraged me to go to this math camp. My dad had a really good friend from work who came uh, to the math camp, so that was a part of the push as well, the encouragement. In high school, I took AP calculus, college level, and physics. I hated physics, but my physics teacher was willing to spend his lunch going over concepts with me to make sure I really understood physics. But in AP calculus, uh, actually just two years ago, I found out that when I was trying to get into my AP calculus class, there was a deaf ed teacher who said no, that because I was deaf, I should only be in the deaf ed class and I should not be a part of the AP Calculus class. And my counselor had to fight back and say, no, she's good at math. And so finally, the high school principal found out about this dispute and said, let her into this AP Calculus class. It wasn't just the principal, but it was also the school superintendent that mm. fought for my spot in the class. So that was really amazing to me. To think that someone that high up had to get involved for me to have a spot in this class. But all of this was going on behind the scenes. I had no clue. I was 17 at the time. I just knew I had been allowed to take this AP calculus class, not knowing everything that had happened and everyone who was involved in that. So you may think that there's no one supporting you. I want to encourage you that there are people that you may not even be aware of who are encouraging you from behind the scenes. So keep that in mind. There also uh, was a group of men. Uh, I was the only female in this group that I was a part of. And I would, they would have discussions and I would try to give my input and they would discard my input. And the teacher would come up to me or come up to the group and I would give my answer to the teacher and the teacher would say, yeah, that's correct. And I said, well, my group doesn't seem to want to listen or they don't think that I have the correct answer. And then I ended up taking 
it upon myself to, you know, share the answer to the larger group. So bit by bit, all of these experiences really help propel me. Um, also, here currently where I work, there is a gentleman who is 59 years old and he is brilliant. He has something that he loves to ask people all the time. Uh, I actually remember him handing me a big packet of information and, and he said that uh, I needed to practice. I was going to have a lab test, a lab testing training, and I needed to study it. He had just put that on me the first time I was going to be working with this team. And he actually left me in the lab during this session, during this test. And uh, I saw this mentor. He became my mentor. He just walked by. He saw me in the lab. He said, just continue on. Keep doing what you're doing. And really, this person was hard to impress. And uh, that's where it started. He, you know, put a lot on me. And because he knew I could do it, he gave me a lot to take care of. He was, you know, a uh, a white older man and he gave me his full support and that really meant a lot to me thank you Johanna thank you for that Melissa please yes I just wanted to say that Joanna is right there's really not one or two people there are so many people behind the scenes that support each of us you know like my mom growing up um, really helped me I had teachers who would tell me that my work was maybe not good enough and at the time it was frustrating but that was a, a sense of support as well but yes i have to thank my parents as well johanna saying yes family family support is crucial and this is scott thank you both uh, i recognize there's a common message coming from the three of you is that your academics uh, your school played a big role in encouraging you and motivating you which aligns with research that shows that over 50% of women dive into the STEM field because they were pushed by some shape or form academically. Whereas men, 50% of men dive into STEM because they uh, have a, a passion for getting involved in that type of work. Uh, so yes, academic school background plays a large role. So you have had positive academic experiences is what it sounds like to me. It seems like your classroom teachers uh, fulfilled their roles in encouraging uh, females to enter the STEM field. Uh, despite maybe no interest being shown, uh, finding role models and searching for ways to make that connection with the students mm -hmm. is what it felt. And so at this point, we'll shift gears a bit and move on to a different topic. We are going to discuss your identity, your female identity in STEM. So Jem, talk to us a bit about entering your peers of men or males and like you said, sharing your thoughts and they just kind of discount or discard your, your ideas. However, you have the solution. So are there any challenges you've experienced, uh, whether in your education or in your career as a female in the STEM field? We'll start with Melissa. Go ahead, Melissa, take it away. That's actually a tough question. I really have to think about that one. Um, I think when it came to my education, I had a lot of females in my industry, so I never really felt that that was a barrier for me. However, when I got into the workforce, a lot of technical companies are uh, predominantly male so when it came to an interview or trying to get a job that is where I felt I you know was facing a more difficult time um, not just being deaf but also being female so I would say one positive thing for me like I said um, there are more women in the industry of UX now, user interface. However, um, having diversity always helps a team. So 
when anytime I was looking for a new job, I would always look to see how their teams interacted with one another. And then I would make the decision if that was a company I wanted to work for. Um, because it would be difficult for me to work in a, in a place that was all men. I'm not sure if that exactly answers your question, though. <laughs> Melissa, I think it does. I think it does answer my question. Uh, some internships, well, STEM internships, are very female dominated, and then some are male dominated. Like you said, uh, most tech companies are run by men, and so that is a challenge that presents itself as well. So thank you, Melissa, for touching upon that. And now I'll ask the same question to you, Miss Johanna. Well, I have three older brothers, and I'm the only girl in my family, so I have already experienced, you know, having a lot of men in my life. Uh, so going through that experience with my family, once I went into the math field, yes, it is predominantly male, and here at work, there are some departments that are predominantly male. However, fortunately, the department that I'm in currently, I think it's made up of about one-third women, which is more than normal. That is surprising. In terms of my identity, I have experienced men challenging me as a female because of being a female. I'd say that's happened a few times, several times that I can remember. Maybe there were other times that just weren't worth remembering. Plus, in high school, I also remember when I took geometry, I was really good at geometry, and uh, the teacher graded the tests th that we had taken, and I got my test back, and I saw this boy, uh, the guy that was sitting next to me was peering over my shoulder, and I was kind of wondering what he was doing, and he said, oh, I was just wondering what grade you got on your test. So I looked over at him and said 98%, and he said, oh, shoot, I got 96%. I've been trying to beat you ever since, you know, all along. And I was shocked. I was like, me? You know, I had a male student who was trying to compete with me, a female student? And that was surprising to me. And that's something that I'll always remember. Um, and also, I talked about my university experience. I won't go into that again. But here at work, um, what has happened? Let me think. I am really proficient in one system. And there was another employee that had a question about that this system. And uh, someone else on the team told them to talk to me about it because I had this system very well figured out. And then they asked this other person, again and they said you know I told you already to ask Joanna she's the expert and a third time he tried to go around me and ask another person so it was clear to me they did not think that I was an expert with this system and that you know made me pretty disgruntled to hear about I explained it to my mentor and my mentor said well this co-worker is an idiot basically <laughs> so I've had several experiences with this person, my mentor tells me, and don't take it ser personally, don't take it seriously. So, and if you have any issues, just talk to me about it, my mentor said. But unfortunately, in class or in school or out in life, um, working with various people, you are going to encounter people who look down upon you. Don't let that bother you. Yes, it's unsettling. However, remember, that there are people supporting you, people that you can see and people that you can't see. Keep that in mind. And that's something I always kept with me that helped me continue through STEM. And it's gotten me to where I am now. Johanna, thank you so much. I give you a big thumbs up on that. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we've got to remember positive experiences. Those are critical. We just have to hang on to them. We're always going to face negative experiences no matter where we are. So true. Now, it's how much we allow them to impact our, our identity or our STEM identity. Yeah, keep your eye on the prize. Keep your eye on your goals. Don't let anything distract you. Right, right. There will always be people that, for some reason, their background or their experience 
they don't realize that a woman can do the same things. So thank you for remaining consistent there. Ashley. Well, in my field, uh, before I got into my field, um, I didn't know what was male or female dominant, but when I went into my program, I noticed that most of the lab techs were female. And I just noticed that and thought, hmm, interesting. There were not a lot of men in that field. I do not know the reason why. I think it's because women maybe start off in school and uh, they end up working in labs um, and then they spread out throughout various different departments and remain with working within a lab. Um, being an MLT, it's never bothered me. However, sometimes I have tried to work with male technicians and had a little bit of a challenge because they do have that thought that women can't do the same thing. But then I just show them I can and show them that, you know, we're working together. It's about teamwork. You know, it's not just what men can do. Women can do the same thing. Sometimes it takes time just to show that, improve that through working together. You know, if men can work in a lab, so can women. My gender identity has really no place within the lab. My current job. My department is 98% female. <laughs> wow, Johanna says, great. Yeah, girl power, <laughs> Ashley says. Thumbs yeah, up, yeah. Right. This is Scott. Yeah, research actually shows that the field of biology uh, works with people, plant, and environment. Those three areas typically tends to be dominated by female because of the nurturing uh, sense. Uh, that is held, and also wanting to see plants grow. And men seem to focus more on logic, uh, statistics, right. uh, numbers, uh, fig solving universal questions. Johanna, engineering field, right? Right. Would you right. Like to more, Johanna. Yes, I did want to add one more thing. Please, sure. I'm not a history expert, but I do know that computer science was heavily populated by women back in the day. Believe it or not, it was uh -huh. dominated. Uh, women even invented some computer things as well. Like I said, I am not an expert in this field, but then after World War II, things changed. This is prior to World War II. After World War II and the men came back from war, then it shifted. So it's important to look back into history and see who helped found things. You know, history is typically oriented towards white males, so just keep that in mind. History uh -huh. books. Um, also hearing uh, stories, but people of color, uh, diverse populations, people with disabilities are often under or not even represented in history. But it's important to keep that in mind in research. Thank you, Johanna. That's a very good point. Uh, it also applies to Rosie, right? The World War II poster, Rosie, yes. You're right. Uh, females had to take over those jobs that the men were doing before they left to war. And, of course, when the men returned, they expected the women to return to their roles and didn't really want them thriving in those previously male-dominated dominated roles. Melissa, go ahead. How Johanna said that she grew up with three older brothers. I grew up with two sisters. And um, all of my closest friends, though, are men. And I've grown up with men around me. So I think that really helps me. I can understand how men think. They're more problem solvers. And um, usually they just want to dive into one thing. They don't want to think about anything else. Just, you know, figure out how to... Uh, like with, fix. This is Johanna. You mean fix? They want to yes, fix. Yes, fix. Thank you. I was looking for the sign. They just want to figure things out, you know? They're problem solvers. And um, sometimes I'll want to help and they'll say no. And I'm like, don't tell me no. But I feel like being told no makes me 
feel like, okay, well, fine. I'm going, I have to fight back in a way, you know, uh -huh. it just motivates me more. For example, in work, I'll have some people who use this word. We hate this word, but mansplain. <laughs> I hate that word. Right. It happens. <laughs> so I just try to think about things at their level and think it's like, oh, I know how they think and analyze it and turn it around and then and give it back to them. Then they know I'm not playing games, you know, but it just helps to show that I understand their perspective. But I have to say I'm really fortunate to work with a diverse group of people um, in a wide range of roles. It's not just men. There's a lot of women. It's all about teamwork and learning how to work with other people. And sometimes you got to help people out. Thank you so much, Melissa. And yes, agreed. Sometimes societies, uh, their expectations are thrown upon people, right? It's uh, what they expect out of a female identity. And uh, sometimes it's rather unfortunate that some women are complacent with those values placed upon them, no matter how off-putting they may be internally. Uh, but I know that there is that voice deep down inside that says, wait a minute, yes, I can get it done. I can do it. And I need to challenge society's beliefs and values. Now, that's not an easy thing to do or accomplish either. But it's important to have a support system to help us through the challenges. And Ashley, I see you've got your hand up. Yes, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, in my MLT experience, people who help train one another have been women. It seems that men have refused to train or teach others. Uh, even though I've approached men and asked them to train me, they're always like, ah, let the women handle it. Let the women train you. So that's always been something I don't understand. I don't know why these specific men did not want to train women. Huh. Huh. I think there was a fear. They, maybe they don't want uh, to train women who may, be, who may not have experience, especially if there was the first time in the lab. They don't want to be asked questions. Maybe they think we're too emotional or something. I don't know. But I just wanted to be taught. I want to know what you know. I want to know what you're thinking. I want to know how to problem solve. Help me figure this problem out. But I guess they look down upon me. But now that there's more women in the department, uh, they probably feel a little less intimidated and they can overcome that. But it's like, just go for it. I'm just a woman, you know, and now I have more opportunity because of schooling and I can't help that. Mm -hmm. Very true, Ashley. Very true. I hope that uh, men's perspective about women in the STEM field does change. However, change won't happen without you. It takes time. Yes. And the next question I'd like to ask is what your vision is for the future. So you're making progress in your field now. What would you like to become in the future? What do you see? What direction do you see yourself heading in? So I'll start with Melissa. <laughs> I was not prepared for this question. <laughs> um, really, I want to stay in user interface, interface but uh, take on more of a managerial role. Um, stay on that side. I guess that would be the best way. It's not really a career, but uh, I would like to collaborate with a lot of different companies. Uh, to see more companies hiring people with disabilities and working with those disabilities, uh, people to become more successful in their career. Um, if I had to decide on a long-term career goal, I guess that would be my answer. It's so hard to answer that. I don't even know what will come in five years. Technology changes so quickly. Um, I'd like to see other fields enter the space of UX, but um, it doesn't drastically change every day. Uh, or it does drastically change, sorry. So I really can't tell you what it will even look like in five years. Melissa, you have a valid point, that's understood. However, I do sense from what you said that you would like to take on a leadership role managing a group of people. I think that's an excellent goal. Yeah. And Johanna, I'll ask you the same question. Well, 
uh, when I think of engineering in the future, I would like to be a part of the control room, to be a part, be in the control room. I have to say, again, I'm awful with history. I have to warn you, I think it was some time around 1969 when we landed on the moon. There were lots of people in the control room working with one another. Um, that, just to give you a picture, that is the picture uh, of a control room. That's what I want to be a part of. I'd say about two or maybe three years ago. Wow, it's already been three years. I can't believe it. Time goes fast. Um, at that time, I always envisioned myself being in the control room, but I just didn't know how I could convince people I belong there. And my mentor actually approached me one day and said, do you feel like you're ready? Do you want to be a part of the control room? Just out of the blue. And I said, you know, what do you need? Do you need an interpreter? What would you need? And I was completely shocked. I didn't have to ask for it, fight for it. I was approached and asked if I wanted to be in the control room. So I replied back and said, yes, I'll need an interpreter. And we figured out what to do. The control room is not the best place for an interpreter because you have a large computer screen and the interpreter had to be on an elevated chair uh, above the screen with everyone watching. So instead of doing that, we had an interpreter uh, we were in a separate room with uh, the control room being projected through video. So yeah, that was back in 2017 that I had that experience. And my mentor took the lead. I was under my mentor. We worked together in that situation. So in the future, I want to be the lead. I want to take on more responsibility within the control room. And then beyond that, in the future, uh, maybe become a chief engineer and have a team of engineers in different departments underneath me. I'd like to be a chief of specific projects or I'd like to become a subject matter expert. Become very knowledgeable in any in the, a specific topic and anyone could ask me for advice or if there's a program. Uh, that needs to go through a review board, I can, you know, say yay or nay. Um, so really, I'd say both of those are my goals. Um, I was approached and asked to become a project manager before, and I declined because I do not like finances. I also don't really like politics. There are some politics involved. Um, so really, that's not my forte. So that's off the table. I'd say the two I just mentioned are in the future for me. So we'll see. Very cool, Johanna. Thank you so much. So just like Melissa, you're looking towards a leadership role. Miss mm -hmm. Ashley, I'll ask you the same question. Well, right now, I'm thinking, right now, uh, I'll still work as an MLT, but in the short term I would like to go back to school and take some more courses more in depth in one particular field as an MLT we work with various different departments urology chemistry microbiology uh, hematology which is the study of blood so I would I have grown a slow appreciation for microbiology and I'd like to become more like a medical lab scientist, an MLS, potentially. But then again, I have thought about taking on a leadership role as well with enough training and with enough schooling. Once I feel ready, I'd like to uh, take the lead and lead the next generation, especially generation of deaf and hard of hearing people. So with that experience, I'll be ready to teach. Um, and I'd say five to 10 years from now, an MLT or MLS job will be in high demand uh -huh. because there's more people, you know, getting sick. And so there's more people who need to be in that field uh, working with, you know, specimen and bodily fluids. And that is something I really uh, do enjoy. I enjoy learning and being trained and picking up on new things. Thank you so much, Miss Ashley. Thank you. And we have run out of time, unfortunately. Uh, we do have to move on, but I noticed that the audience members are asking questions. Uh, one of the questions is, 
is the Focus Science Information Technology and Lab. And it seems like, Johanna, you are focused on an engineering lab, and Ashley, uh, a yes medical and no, lab. Both. <laughs> and, yes. and Melissa, you are focused more on technology. You're, well, and interaction interface, technology interface. Another person does ask a question saying, which STEM field are you hoping to see an increase of deaf and hard of hearing women in? So all which? of them, Joanna says. A good all idea. of them. All right, Johanna. Yes, all of them. All all right. of them. What do you mean? You can't pick all one. All. Melissa is saying it's so diverse, too. You can't just, you're not just limited to S-T-E-M to STEM. Really, each of those can be expanded upon greatly. We haven't even touched everything. So there's things we can't even think of. There's other deaf women also. There's... Um, there's other women out there, so growing those connections and growing that foundation to help young deaf youth will be really helpful. Joanna saying it's also really cool to talk with people and ask them to explain their work, you know, and using the same language, using American Sign Language, having those dialogues, that discussion, of course, all of the STEM. <laughs> Well, thank you. I really enjoy your enthusiasm and your spirit. So we'll move on to our last topic for the night now, topic number three. What advice would you give to the educators of deaf and hard of hearing female youth? Uh, now, just give me a couple blurbs of the type of advice you'd give. Uh, I like that you said, yes, any, any field of STEAM is where we want to dive into. So we'll go ahead and start with Ms. Ashley. Go ahead. Uh, advice for all educators of deaf and hard of hearing. Are we talking about females? Yeah, females, right? Yes, younger, yep, young female students, sure. I just encourage them, if you have an interest, go for it. If you're interested in science, go for it. If you're interested in engineering, I say explore it. Uh, find out what's available in your area. For example, in D.C., they have the U.S. Science and Engineering Festival in Washington, D.C. I think it's um, at the Conference Center. That happens in April. I don't remember the exact date, but it's free admission as well, and all kids are free to go, educators too. I say the more, the better. Um, I went myself two times, and I also volunteered for that organization, and I have really enjoyed it seeing so many different types of STEAM, robotics, engineering, just it's amazing. I think that's a wonderful exposure for kids, especially young girls. Um, I won't say no. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Ashley. Thank you so much. Excellent, excellent comments. Uh, Johanna, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, there have been a few examples. I'd say just focus on the positive, ignore the negative. Um, but when I'm thinking about advice for adults who are teaching or encouraging young students in STEM, just like Ashley said, yeah, encouragement is important. And I also think about um, leadership or I'm sorry, ho hosting a club or um, I joined the robotics club myself, and there was a staff member who uh, was a chemistry teacher who was a female that led this club. So uh, it's important to have women take the lead. And there were male students in that group as well. But just get involved, encourage your students to be involved in STEAM or STEM uh, things. And we need more representation, more female representation. Teachers are mostly women, yes, but representation is so crucial. Uh -huh. Encouraging. Uh -huh. Encourage the students to go and actually do it. Encourage them to participate. Tell them to go and then to teach you, the teacher, something. That will get them involved. Bring them in. Hook them. Get them interested. And you can do that by telling the student to teach you something. That will get them. That is excellent advice, Johanna. Thank you. And Melissa, we'll ask you the same question. Well, all of this advice that was mentioned is good. And I also have a friend that 
I've talked with this about, about this with for a while now. Um, I really wish that we had a science fair like they have nowadays, uh, back when I was in school. And maybe if not at your school, or maybe other schools can uh, meet one another and mix and come together, problem solve. In a science fair, there's so many different parts. You know, there's research, uh, diagnostics, calculations. There's so many different pieces that collaboration is key. It's all about how you collaborate with one another, which will help you in your future job as well. One thing I've noticed is that if you cannot collaborate as a child, that's the hardest thing uh, to overcome. You know, that's something you have to learn to do in for the rest of your life. Work together, teamwork, collaborate, uh, share your ideas. For example, you could use social media even. And, you know, how talk about how to develop a better social media and or how you can develop and improve STEM within that. I think the three of you just shared some excellent points and excellent advice. I hope the audience viewing can feel inspired to share some of this with their students. Thank you all. We have five minutes left. And at this point, I'll start wrapping things up. Give me just a second. Right. I looked into a couple different websites for resources, uh, which have representation of women in the STEM field. And as you can see, there is actually a summit for women in the STEM field. Almost the same concept as what Ashley mentioned about her experience attending that uh, festival, the US Engineers Festival. And I am in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, pretty soon in March, we're having the annual Atlanta Science Fair which is actually a two-week science fair full of events. And I'm sure that uh, your local area has something and is something you can take your students to enjoy. I always encourage teachers to become a part of professional organizations. There's the National Science Teachers Association, National Math Teachers Association. There's a the National Engineer, Educator Engineers Association. Uh, they have plenty of resources, workshops, and uh, conventions that one can attend, which is extremely neat. And one of the best benefits from being in a professional organization is that you have access to updated and current information. So that keeps you at the edge of the field. This is a slide with other resources that I use for preparing my webinars, meaning that these align with science and ASL. A lot of times, sign language stu students don't see science via sign language. They see it in English. But science is for any culture, any gender, anybody. So deaf and hard of hearing community has been increasing the amount of resources so that deaf youth and students can feel that connection and can identify with other uh, STEM professionals. And now this slide has some resources for teachers, some really cool websites there that you can incorporate and use in your classrooms. And just like Johanna mentioned, in regards to problem solving, uh, there's activities that, that can be done there. And just like Ashley also mentioned, the activities in the lab, Melissa touched upon too, having to work with the team, having to collaborate. There are plenty of opportunities and resources that will touch on each one of these key areas listed on the slide there. And also I want to give a reminder that our next webinar will be happening March 18th, and we'll touch upon deaf and hard of hearing people of color in the STEM field today. I also would like to ask for you all to respond to our survey. Your input and your feedback enhances uh, the, sem the webinars we provide and your experience here. Again, I'd like to extend my gratitude to everyone uh, that attended in our audience and Johanna, Ashley, Melissa, thank you. Big hand wave cheers to you three. Um, thank you, you for having us. Yes, you are the best. I really enjoyed our conversation tonight. Hopefully we can start a network and we can 
grow the group of deaf, hard of hearing women in the STEM field. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. Let's yes. grow it. Cheers. Thank you.